On today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at the Voxelab Aquila S2. This is Voxelab's newest printer in their lineup. They've changed up a few things. This hot end for one, the bed for another. We're gonna dissect this hot end later in the video. We're gonna see some first prints. We're gonna see what's in the box. We're gonna make this new fan shred. We're gonna customize some firmware. We have a lot to do. We're gonna do it all together. And here we go. Folks, welcome back. I am Leo of Prince Leo 3D, and today we're gonna to be talking about the Voxelab S2. But before we do, I have a disclaimer, and it's the best disclaimer I'm ever going to give. This printer was sent to me free of charge from Voxelab. It happened. Not sure why, not sure how. So I wanna thank Voxelab. I wanna thank anyone in the community whom they reached out to to find me, because I don't believe they found me on their own. So thank you everyone out there. So now sitting next to me, of course, we have this Voxelab S2. It's the same line as all the other Voxelab Aquilas, except this is a derivative of that. It's got a few different changes, namely the hot end design and the bed. Everything else for the most part is the same. We have a similar build size, similar main board, all the aluminum extrusion is all the same. The spool mount is the same, although it'll be looking forward instead of behind like on the other Aquilas. Now, before we get anywhere, I wanna talk about these rail inserts and this fan shroud. I added all those after I got it out of the box. It doesn't come like this. It looks more like this when you first get it out of the box. I added all these things. These rail inserts are great for stopping filament from getting through, and this mount is going to help us put this BL touch on, but we're gonna get into that later in the video. Now, the first change Voxlam made is in their bed. One of these changes is this build plate. The original Aquila comes with a glass build plate, whereas this opts to come with a PEI coated steel flex sheet. This is awfully cool. Now I have a whole nother video dedicated to these PEI flex sheets. If you're interested in it, I suggest you go take a look at it because these are really, really awesome. Now what this is, it's a steel sheet, flexible obviously, and it's been coated in PEI, which is polytheramide. The great thing about PEI is it loves certain types of filament, namely PLA, PETG, and TPU. They love to adhere to this stuff. So we're not gonna have to worry about glue sticks or anything like that. We don't need to scuff this surface up. It's all ready to go out of the box. And the reason it's flexible is because once our prints adhere to it, we don't need to use any spatula or scraper to get them off. We simply bend the flex plate and our prints will fly off. It's really, really convenient. And right here, the top of the build plate has been covered with a magnet. This is steel, this is a magnet. So all we need to do is drop it on basically, and it's going to stick. Of course, we're going to make sure it lines up, but it's as easy as that. Now that's sort of a minor change, but right up here is something completely out of the ballpark from the original Aquila. This is a direct drive unit. And this direct drive unit is equipped with an all metal hot end capable of temperatures 300 Celsius. That's tremendous. That means you can print all those high temperature exotic filament types, ABS, nylon, PC, anything carbon fiber filled. All those are available to you now. And that's all due to the all metal hot end that is behind this fan shroud. Now in this video, we're gonna dissect that hot end pretty well. And I wanna just upfront talk about what an all metal hot end is because the nomenclature of it is a little confusing. When we say all metal hot end, we aren't necessarily talking about the components. If you were to look at the original base Aquila, that hot end is made of all metal components, but it's not an all metal hot end. Why is that? What distinguishes an all metal hot end from not is how far a PTFE tube goes to the nozzle or to the melting zone. On the base Aquila, the PTF tube goes all the way down to the tip of the nozzle. That means whatever temperature our nozzle gets, our PTFE tubing gets, and that's not really a good thing. At around 210 degrees Celsius, PTFE can start off-gassing harmful chemicals. Now they might not be that bad for us, but if you have pets in the house, namely birds, they are very susceptible to being harmed by those. That would be a non-all metal hot end. What an all metal hot end does is it separates the PTFE tubing 
from the nozzle or from the melting zone. And that's what we're going to explore today when we open up this hot end. We're gonna see where that PTFE tubing stops and where the melting zone begins. And generally between those two, there'll be a small to medium sized heat break that helps dissipate any heat. So that PTFE tubing is nowhere near those high temperatures. Now right up front, Voxlib did tell me, and I'll mention this again in the video, that inside this all metal hot end, there is going to be some PTFE liner. Hopefully, however, it's going to be a short amount and it's gonna be nowhere near the melting zone. We're gonna look into that a lot later though. Now, even though this printer can print all these exotic high temperature filaments, we have to also keep in mind the nozzle that comes equipped here is brass and brass is a softer metal. So if we print anything with carbon fiber in it, or if we print anything that's abrasive, glow in dark filaments, wood filaments, that's going to begin to erode our brass nozzle and it's going to need to be replaced. And another thing about this nozzle, it is proprietary. Not a big fan of that word. And the reason it is, is because the length. It is an 11 millimeter long nozzle, so it's not gonna be easy to find. So we wanna make sure if we're gonna put abrasive filaments through here, we have at least one or two nozzles on hand just to replace them. That is just the all metal hot end we're talking about. What about this whole unit? This is a direct drive unit. That means the stepper motor and the extruder have been mounted right here above our hot end. On our base Aquila, the stepper driver and the extruder are right here. They're right behind the Z screw and there's a long Bowden tube that connects it to the hot end, not here. It's all been moved here and it's right on our gantry. Positives and negatives to this. Obviously a negative is there's added weight to our X axis gantry. So we have to consider that weight when we determine our printing speeds. Positives, direct drives units can print TPU out of the box with no aftermarket necessities. That means we don't need to buy a BMG clone extruder or any other extruder that's covered. This can print TPU just as it stands right out of the box. Now another difference with this direct drive is slicer settings. When we go into our slicer and add this printer, we have to note there's a direct drive. There's not many changes that need to be done, but there is one particular one, and that is the retraction. A normal Bowden style retraction is around 6.5 millimeters. Something like this, a direct drive unit has a much, much smaller amount of retraction. This one is going to have around one millimeter of retraction. Now that's what I started with. Of course, you're gonna to wanna to run some retraction test to see exactly what works perfectly for your printer. Now, before we dig into the nitty gritty of this printer, I wanna talk about one more thing, and that is our main board. Inside our main board, we have a chip. The Voxeleb Aquila's biggest weakness right now is the main board chip. Outside of this machine, the Voxeleb Aquila comes equipped with three chips, a G32, an N32, and an H32. That's how they're known, because those are the manufacturers. The H32 is the worst amongst them. It can only take stock firmware. Now, if you don't expect you're gonna do any firmware upgrades, you're not gonna add a BL touch or anything like that, an H32 might not be bad for you. But if you look to modify your printer, an H32 is no good. Next is the N32. This is a great chip. It can be modified by community firmware. However, you can't upgrade this chip to Clipper. Lastly, the G32. This chip can be modified with community firmware, and you can also upgrade a G32 equipped mainboard to Clipper. Now what Clipper is, is a different flavor of firmware. Right now, our printer comes stock with Marlin. And when we upgraded again, Alex's firmware, that's Marlin. Clipper is a different flavor. It does things a little differently. You might not even have to worry about that at all, but if tinkering with these machines is important to you and exploring the vast array of things we can do, then you might want to consider that. Now when you buy a base Aquila, it's luck of the draw what three chips you're gonna get. You don't know. On this machine, however, you do. There's only two availabilities for this machine, an N32 and an H32, and you get to pick. Now, we're never gonna pick the H32. I mean, if you want to, you can, but you're really hampering yourself. When you buy this machine, the only chip you wanna pick as of the date of this publication is an N32, because that is the only chip that we can modify the firmware to community built firmware. If you're buying this machine, get the N32 chip. Now, without much more further ado, we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of this machine. We're not gonna do an assembly. We are gonna open the box, see what's inside. We're gonna dissect this hot end. We're gonna see some first prints. We're gonna look at some custom firmware and we're gonna see how we got here with this customized fan shroud and BL touch mount. When we open the box, we see that voltage reminder that we have to set the right voltage. We of course have the instruction manual that is built for the S2. It comes with that spare red filament. The 
uh, monitor that we've seen. It doesn't have the Voxerlab logo on it anymore, the metal mount for that screen. Power cord. This is our X-axis carriage and stepper motor. Here is the base of the printer. Everything's together. We've got the PEI sheet on it. Here are our rails, including the Z end stop rail. Here is our Z screw or our T-type screw, and it is still ungreased. Z motor right here. Next, we have a spatula. It's kind of unnecessary. We have the PEI coated bed cover for our X-axis uh, stepper motor. Here is the two components that make up our spool holder. Rollers on the X carriage to the right side of the machine. Nuts and bolts and spare tools they give us to erect the machine. Here's the belt, SD card, and a little nozzle cleaner. Here's a spare parts uh, kit. And you'll notice right here the nozzle. The nozzle is larger than normal. It is 11 millimeters. It is proprietary. We really don't like things that are proprietary around here for two reasons. One, I have a really hard time saying the word proprietary. And two, it tends to make those products harder to find. Now, Voxlim has assured me they will have an abundance of these nozzles available, but you will only be able to purchase them from Voxelab. So now I'd like to take a look at the hot end of our S2. This is a direct drive model, meaning we're going to have the stepper motor on top of the hot ends, all going to be on our X carriage. Right here, we're looking at the front cover, the stepper motors behind that, and then encapsulated in all this is our hot end and our two fans. This is a side view. You can see the actual all metal hot end poking through the side. And because direct drive is all one unit on our X gantry, it's going to be added weight. So I wanted to see exactly how much added weight. When I weighed our direct drive unit, that's the stepper motor on the hot end, it came to one pound, let's call it three ounces, 19 total ounces. I then wanted to take a look at what our base Aquila hot end weighs. I didn't take it all off my machine, but I had enough parts laying around that I could make it work. So if we add a hot end, it's about one ounce. We throw the fan shroud on, a cool parts cooling fan. We're gonna add a regular hot end fan. Let's throw a BL touch and a BL touch mount. We got to about 4.2 ounces call it five ounces just for those parts and now i didn't have the x carriage but i had a spare one for my cr10 it's probably going to be a little bulkier and that came in at around 3.7 let's call it four ounces so if we add the x-axis carriage with all our other hot end materials we get to about nine ounces that's nine ounces for the original aquila hot ends and now this s2 came in at 19 ounces that is more than double the weight. So that's just something we have to consider when we're adjusting the speed settings in our slicer. We might have to lower that speed because we have to consider that the x-axis is now moving around a lot more weight and we might have to account for that. So it's time we explore this hot end and to do so, we need to remove the fan shroud. Very simple, two screws, one on top next to the cables, one on the side under the stepper motor. There's nothing else attached to this fan shroud so it should pop right off. We're now looking at a front shot of our uncovered hot end. On top, we have the stepper motor and the extruder. And below that, we have a parts cooling fan. And to the left is our hot end fan. Bit of a deviation of orientation from our base model Aquila. The parts cooling fan is to the side and the hot end fan is in front on that model. So don't get confused. If you need to make an change or an adjustment to this machine, they are swapped. We're now looking at the side profile of the uncovered hot end. On top, we have the extruder. Behind that's the stepper motor. And below that is our all metal hot end. I want to remove that from the gantry and I want to take a look at it. To do so, I need to loosen this grub screw right here. It is the only thing holding it onto the carriage. After I loosen it, I gently tug it down and it should release itself. And right here, we can see the top of the hot end. Now, we can also see something else. It, it seems to be PTFE lined. It's really important we inspect our hot end right now because we want to see how far this PTFE liner goes. Now, Voxelab was very upfront with me when I was sent this machine. I also received an email and it explained that this all metal hot end does have a PTFE liner. However, it says that it is outside of the melting zone. After checking the top section here, we remove the thermistor, we remove the heating tube, and now we have the all metal hot end off of the machine entirely so we can inspect it. Now, starting from the bottom to the top, we have the nozzle. Above that is the heating block. Above that is the heat break. Very, very important part. That is what's going to quite literally break the heat up between our heating block or our melting zone and our heat sink. And above our heat break is our heat sink. And that is supposed to dissipate heat even more. Now, from our top view, we saw there is PTFE lining in our heat sink. Let's remove it from the hot end and see how far it goes. And that is a major yikes. I did not think that this PTFE tubing would extend down past the heat sink. 
So right here at the bottom, this white exposed portion is PTFE tubing. So now that means that this PTFE tubing runs from the complete top of this heatsink to past the bottom of it. That's a little worrying depending on how deep this goes into the heat break. So let's go ahead, remove the heat break, remove the nozzle and take a look. This right here is the heat break. The top portion is where the heat sink would sit and the bottom portion is where the nozzle would sit. Now I wasn't sure exactly how much of this was considered a heat break, how much of this was outside of the melt zone. I had to remove the nozzle to find out. And what I found was a little troubling. Let's look at a side view of this, of the hot end again and break it down. We know this top portion here is the heat sink. We know that it is PTFE lined. We also know we have an 11 millimeter proprietary nozzle that is extending itself up into the heat break. The distance between our PTFE tubing and our nozzle is extremely small. Our heat break section is extremely small. Let's take another look at that heat break. This is the portion that I thought was acting as a heat break, but in reality, this is the portion that acts as a heat break. Now I've said this before, I will say it again, I am a complete moron. I am not an expert in anything. Voxaleb has hired engineers, scientists, no doubt, geniuses, and according to them, they have found the correct distance between PTFE lining and melt zone. So I'm willing to believe them, but I am slightly cautious and I will definitely be keeping an eye on this. I will be removing this heat break from time to time and checking to see if that PTFE liner is getting burnt. Our machine having been assembled off camera, we are ready to turn it on and auto home it for the first time. We do this to check our end stops, make sure all the electrics running to the proper areas and all the movement on the carriages is correct. After that, it's time for some calibrations. The first one I'm going to do here is an E-step calibration. We have to remove that fan shroud to access the hot end. We remove the hot end like you saw me do in the previous steps of this video, and we can let the filament now run through the hot end without going out the nozzle. After that, I start on bed leveling. I'm giving myself a head start here by adjusting the Z end stop. And after that, it's good old fashioned bed leveling using a post-it note to go from corner to corner to make sure this bed is level. Now I have a whole video on this and Z offset. I recommend you watch it because that's the exact steps I follow every time I get a new printer. And that's what we're doing right now. After I'm confident my bed is level, it's time to insert some filament. The first filament I decided to go with was good old fashioned PLA. And here we are with the start of our first print. Again, this is a bed level Z offset adjustment print. It's going to be a skirt around five squares. Those squares are 20 by 20 by one layer high. And as this skirt prints around, I'm checking the adhesion and I'm checking how squished it is into the bed. You'll see my hands rolling over the edges of the skirt. I'm seeing how well it's sticking. It appears to be sticking good. I give the thumbs up. After the skirt is done printing, it prints the squares one by one. I'm looking at it and I'm feeling it to see how well my level is. After all five squares have finished, it's time to look and see how the level looks. And it is spot on. I must have got really lucky. It looks like there's no warpage or curvage to this bed at all. This level was near perfect. Time to start with some more prints. First print I went with was an XYZ calibration cube. And this is the collection of PLA prints I did. A bunch of XYZ cubes, as you can see, a Benchy standard calibration print. And that is a phone stand that I designed that is meant to be printed support free. So adhesion is a real factor there. And it's not an easy print, even though it looks like it is. This printer took it on in stride. It printed it really nicely, great adhesion. It came out very well. The next filament I wanted to tackle was PETG. I wanted to try and get up to some of the higher temps that this printer can do. And as you can see, these printed really, really nice. We have a temperature tower. We have an XYZ cube. Right in front there is a cooling fan shroud for my URI-1 ER20. PETG was done. I wanted to try something different. Let's try TPU. That's what direct drives are known to do well. And the first print I chose to do was this Benchy. Now you can see a little bit of issues on the hull. I think that might be a cooling issue. At some point down the line, maybe we should modify that parts cooling fan. After that, I printed some of these ear savers. Looked like easy prints, not necessarily. A lot of small movements, 
but this machine did a great job with it. Now having got a baseline of prints, knowing it was printing really well, I wanted to go from stock firmware to Alex's firmware, to community firmware, because I wanted to enjoy all the features that that firmware is going to offer me. So we upgraded our firmware, we upgraded the firmware on our screen, and we started printing again. The first prints I did were again PLA, and they came out beautifully. Another cube, an awesome Doctor Strange bust, and another Benchy. Really, really well. One thing I did notice with this firmware, though, because it's based around the Aquila, the high temp didn't get as high as we needed. It maxed out at 260. However, we have the all-metal hot end. We want to be able to go up to 300 degrees C. So we had to go in and customize our own firmware. While we were in there, we changed the name to the Aquila S1. And then we also shrunk the bed size. Now, on the base Aquila, we can increase our bed size to 235 by 235. However, I noticed some printing issues when the x-axis was at 235. So I brought it down to 225. I then increased the max temp on our hot end. I figured while I was here, let's go ahead and add a BL touch and see if we can get that working. However, I noticed we had no mount for the BL touch. Well, it's time to do a little bit of design. We jump into Fusion 360 and we design ourselves a fan shroud that can accompany a BL touch mount. Now, design here wasn't crazy. I literally copied the exact design of the Vox Lab Aquila fan shroud, and all I did was add that BL Touch mounting bracket to the side. This is what the shroud looks like having been printed. This was printed on my Ender 5, uh, just got upgraded with Clipper at about 150 millimeters per second, so it's not the cleanest print, but my goodness, does this thing print fast. So now it's time to try out our BL Touch. The first materials we tried were that 250 degree PETG, and these things printed awesome. BL Touch was working nice. The firmware was again running really clean. We went to TPU and it was printing like glass. We were able to get these Galaxy S21 phone cases printed without any trouble at all. Now, when I said those two Galaxy S21 phone cases printed without a problem, it was a bit of a lie I was telling. The first two times I printed it, I had issues. My TPU was getting tangled inside my extruder. Now, I was caught a little off guard because this machine was printing TPU excellently before that. I had no problem with any prints. And it's a direct drive model. You assume TPU is going to be easier than normal to print. However, Voxelab did tell me there is an upgraded piece on the extruder. And that is supposed to help with TPU printing. Now, up to this point, I didn't need it. But then, of course, at one point, which is right here, I was getting TPU tangled around my extruder. And you could see it right there at the bottom. So what I had to do was take off the extruder arm and untangle it. Now, at this time, I decided it was a good idea to print that replacement piece. And here it is. The left side is the one I print. On the right is their stock model. I replaced the PETG one onto the extruder. And immediately, I can already notice it is really, really snug. I wasn't sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing. We want a tighter filament path because that was the issue. The stock one's filament path is a little too wide. So if we're doing a lot of retractions, meaning that there's a lot of movement in the TPU, starts and stops as it pulls up, it can get tangled. Now you can see how loose this stock one is on our extruder. I was worried though because this PET G one I printed was almost too tight. We remounted it and I wanted to give it a shot. And the mounting of this is very, very simple. It's only two screws, one right here towards the outside. And then the next one is in the extruder arm. This is the hardest part. You got to apply a little bit of downward pressure. Don't crush your cooling fan shroud, but you got to apply downward pressure while you're tightening that other screw. Now, with this PETG part, I did have issues. The filament path was too tight. I couldn't even advance filament through it. So I printed yet another one, the one we just saw. This is out of PLA. And this one goes on the extruder pretty nicely. It's snug, but it's not too snug. It snaps into place but there's still some wiggle room. So when you print something like this, you have to make sure your tolerances are correct. Even if your printer is printing really pristine, there are times when tolerances will just be, you know, 0.1 millimeters above or beyond what you need. So you might have to print this piece a few times. However, Voxlab did assure me, newer models coming off the factory floor will not need this piece. It will be stock, so you won't have to print this anymore. But for anyone that's buying printers now and they're getting ones right from the factory, this is a printable piece you're probably going to need if you're interested in printing TPU at high rates of speed. Folks, that's it. We did a lot in this time period. We gave a lot of information out. I hope it wasn't too much, but I really wanted to get as much as I could about the inner workings of this printer out there. Now you saw a lot of the prints I did. They were really gorgeous. They weren't these multi-day, multi-hour prints. We know these machines can do that. We just want to make sure this machine can get up 
and running and print consistently, which is what we found. Now, if you were to ask me what would you buy, an Aquila or an Aquila S2, completely different machines for completely different people, just like most things in 3D printing. The base Aquila is cheaper, the S2 is more expensive. However, if you were going to modify your base Aquila to get here, direct drive, all metal hot end, PEI sheet, you're probably going to spend around the same money because you're also going to need a dual gear extruder to be able to print your TPU. So how do you want to enter the 3D printing world? Do you want to start a little cheaper, modify as you go, or do you want to jump right in with a printer that is already modified? Now for me, this is a second or third printer. That sounds crazy, I know. I didn't think I'd have more than one, but you will one day, trust me. And this is that printer. You've saved your money with an Aquila, you kind of got your hands dirty, and right here, this is kind of set to go. It's a different approach, it's a direct drive, and it has a lot of the accoutrement that you're gonna modify anyway, so you might as well just get it right out of the box. Now, I also wanna thank Voxlab so much for providing me this printer. It is a heck of an opportunity, and I really, really appreciate it. Being able to print with this and test it has really been an honor, and it's felt great, so thank you very much. Now, besides this mount, we also have made an additional mount. If you wanted to keep the stock metal mount, but you wanted to use a BL Touch, I created a mount that sticks right out here under the stepper motor and can still hold a BL Touch. So all these things, all the files I've used here, it's gonna be in the description. Always check the description of these videos out because I'm constantly adding things. So as I keep printing with this, I'm gonna make updates to that description. Please read the comments. There are excellent questions, excellent answers, and usually people are calling me out in the comments because I always make a mistake. I'm one person, I don't mean to make mistakes, but I will, and I appreciate everyone correcting me. It makes us all better. We're a community. We're a 3D printing community. We're a world community. We just try to make each other better, and I appreciate all of you for helping me do that. So if you stayed around this long, thank you so much. If you liked the video, you can subscribe because you'll get notified when I make more videos. Leave a comment, those are always great. Love the conversation, like the video, because that makes me happy. Other than that, not much to it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sticking around so much, and until next time, boys, girls, Everyone else, keep on printing.